All right, everybody. It looks like the incoming attendees have kind of slowed down a little bit. So welcome to everyone to our Missouri Bird Photography webinar this evening. Um, before we begin, just so attendees know, I know that we've had some folks join us before, for, but for those who haven't, if you're not very familiar with Zoom, you should see some controls. Um, <clears throat> these buttons that look like this, probably they're at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're on a different device, they might be um, somewhere else, but you'll have a chat and a Q&A. So just so you all know, us that are the panelists, we cannot see or hear any of you, um, but you can communicate to us and to each other through the chat. And if you've got any technical issues, go ahead and, and um, ask about those in the chat or anything else that you want to comment on. If you have a question, please, during the presentations, go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A box and we will have time for Q&A at the end with all of our photographers. So my name is Dana Ripper. I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Missouri River Bird Observatory. And I'm really excited to have um, these panelists with us tonight. I think that you can see that they all have human faces as well as uh, these being their bird photos. Um, but we're gonna hear from Dave Stoner, who's a photographer with the Missouri Department of Conservation and who has been a judge of our photo contest here at our MRBO um, for the last few years. Steve Johnson, um, who's from the Kansas City area, Bill Blackledge, also from Kansas City, and Eric Ost, who is MRBO's field crew leader, are all going to speak tonight about um, their, their photos and their methods and kind of whatever um, inspires them about their photography. So I'm really happy to have you guys. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so the Missouri River Bird Observatory, our mission is the conservation of Missouri's birds and their habitats via science, education, and advocacy. Um, and so this photo contest that we've been running since 2016 um, is based on the Emily Dickinson poem, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, because we believe that birds inspire hope um, and joy in people. And so this is a fundraiser for our organization's education and outreach program. Um, and we have prizes for winning photographers that are sponsored by Wooden Houston Bank. But one of the even more important reasons for this contest, um, and I learned this very quickly after our first one in 2016, is that all of these wonderful photos are just great when we're doing reports or newsletters or public presentations or social media um, because birds are so inspiring. Um, and so we sort of use the photos that are entered in this contest to really inspire love and care for birds. So the photo contest categories and um, associated uh, submissions such as a conservation description about the photographer's photos, those have changed a little bit over the years. And I'll tell you briefly about that. But um, before our photographers speak, I just wanted to show you some of the wonderful pictures that we've gotten over the years. So in 2016, you can see the number of photos we had submitted during our first year from 38 photographers. This was our grand prize winner. This was our first place winner. Our second place. And our third place. And so the contest grew a little bit in 2017, as you can see, we had um, a lot more photos entered. You can tell by the numbers that a lot of photographers choose to enter several photos. Um, so we also added a couple of different categories in 2017. We uh, have a youth category. Um, so youth photographers can win prize money of their own. Um, and then a director's choice, which largely stemmed from um, Ethan Duke, my co-director, and I really wanting to be able to um, help judge the contest. And so that means that we can't, we don't administer the contest anymore because it needs to be totally anonymous. Um, but the director's choice um, judging has been really fun. So here was our grand prize in 2017. Our first place, and I think you can recognize that's one of our panelists tonight. Our second place. And this is our third place that also happened to be um, a youth photographer that actually won the, the adult um, third place category. Here's our youth winner. 
And here is our director's choice. So we did stick with the same categories in 2018. Um, and you can see again, uh, we had quite a lot of photos come in. This is our grand prize in that year. First place. Second place. Hmm, there's a known name again. Third place. Our youth entry. And then our director's choice. Um, so we kind of wanted to change things up um, in 2019. And so in that year, we changed to having several different categories. We still had um, a grand prize that was, you can consider that like the best in show, the best from all the categories. Um, and then we sort of split up the categories by habitat. And so last year, um, these were our, the scores came out exactly the same over um, the five judges. And so the grand prize winner winning was actually split between Steve Johnson, who's with us tonight, and photographer Amy Watts. And then in our habitat categories, we had wetland birds. And you can see um, on the left-hand side is our adult winner. And on the right-hand side is our youth winner. Prairie birds, adult winner and youth winner. Forest birds. And backyard birds. And so that was pretty fun um, to have different categories for the photo contest fourth year. And this year, one of the things that we did was um, before starting the contest, we actually pulled photographers from previous years and asked them what they would like to see in terms of categories. Um, and the things that got the most votes were um, families of birds and photos that MRBO needs for its education and outreach the most. Um, so we kind of combined those into, you can see some families here and, and guilds in the terms of the chickadees, runs, and titwice. Um, and then we also have a special category that we're calling of time and place. Um, and that is related to the coronavirus pandemic. And basically we've heard a lot of different stories from people about how, you know, their lives have changed, but how they're taking comfort in nature and in their photography and in bird watching and how um, COVID has, the, the, the COVID situation has, has really obviously caused changes in their lives, um, but they are maybe appreciating birds and the peace they get from being out in nature a little bit more. So that's what that category is about. Um, so we're, the contest is open right now. And with that, I am going to turn it over to David Starr. I will stop sharing. All right, you got me? So there you, I see you and I'm ready for your screen share. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say thanks, uh, Dana. And it's been a real pleasure and honor to um, help judge the contest for these past few years. Uh, and just, I, I appreciate you showing some of the past entries because they really are awesome. So many of those I would have been tickled to have uh, snapped myself and have in my portfolio. So seeing the quality of work that comes out of this contest is really amazing. Um, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen. We got that? Yep, that worked. Okay. All right, so I just wanted to run through a few of my photos uh, and, and run through a few things that you might want to keep in mind and that I try and keep in mind when I'm out, photog uh, you know, working on my photography and stuff. I get to travel all over the state um, and I've learned quite a few uh, just things I, I try and keep in the back of my mind. Um, number one is keep your camera with you. I cannot tell you how many times I have missed a photo because I didn't have my camera with me. I drive around with it on my lap all the time. Um, it's, I've taken so many hikes and thought, boy, if I was half a photographer, I'd have had my camera with me today because an amazing, you know, I found a waterfall or an amazing sunset or something like that. This, I was driving down the road along the current river and this Kingfisher was just 
five feet off the road. Um, I almost could have reached out and touched him. I had to back the truck up actually to, to get this frame of him. So it's just kind of always being open to what, what may just develop. It seems like when I'm searching for something, I never find it. But when I stop looking, that's when the magic happens. Another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we all have, there's a lot of different uh, skill levels uh, that enter the contest and um, you know, budgets, uh, you know, there's, there's kids up to, uh, you know, seasoned professionals. And so the level of gear may not always be uh, what you exactly want, but working with what you have, don't be afraid to, to uh, include the landscape if you can't afford that super long lens. Um, just remembering that, you know, work with what you've got and, and move your feet to, to get around. Um, one thing I keep in mind is looking for something that has some good action or something that's interesting about the subject. Watching this owl at a snow covered landscape at Bilby Ranch up in Northern Missouri, I was amazed at how well it blended into the landscape. And I thought this photo just kind of really illustrated the amazing camouflage that these little creatures possess um, tucked here into this tuft of grass as well. Uh, babies are never to be discounted for, uh, for good results when uh, pictures are involved. Another thing that's kind of fun is like quirky, quirky behavioral habits or something that uh, is just a little more than, than a standard portrait. I think can have a good, a good bearing on an otherwise pretty normal subject. However, portraits, um, you know, and the gravitas and the the, the feeling that they can bring, I think, is a, is really important uh, if if you have the long lenses and the equipment to make that happen. Uh, this one is is just another one of the. Uh, like the kind of the habits of the animals is this one mimics mom and uh, as she after she flew out of the nest the baby's kind of trying to flap flap its wings and, and mimic mom i thought it was a cute shot um so this one falls into that you don't always need the longest lens possible to get a to get a cool shot uh this was at uh, one of the wetlands on the mississippi river in missouri Again, looking for using what you've got. This was a 24 to 70 lens. Um, just trying to make some patterns, work with the birds, rather than always zooming in on the tight headshot portrait. Uh, this one thing I try and keep in mind is good lighting. I think the back lighting on this one is really nice. It really makes the feathers pop. Again, these uh, youngsters are always... Uh, always a cute addition and the, the kind of repetition of form in this I thought uh, was nice and, and almost like peering through the leaves gave a sense of, you know, that you were, you were looking through a window into another, another life. To go along with uh, always keeping my camera with me, I was out looking for a wetland back in March over in St. Louis and came across a flooded farm field on the side of the road and just about wrecked the truck trying to stop uh, for the, I'm going to say thousands of pelicans that were in this flooded farm field on the side of the road. Uh, it was completely unexpected. It was right at sunset. It was amazing. Uh, numerous people came by and stopped and took pictures as well. Uh, and they were gone the next day. So it was a definitely a fleeting moment. I got some really nice video of it too, of, of the just lines and lines of, of birds swimming back and forth. Um, one thing to keep in mind is good light. Uh, that's another thing I always look for in the photos I take. And then in, you know, as far as the judging goes, um, the edges of day are always, always the, the best light. It's not necessarily the only time to photograph, but Good light makes makes for good photos. Um, you know, this was just, a, I stumbled across this family of swans, keeping my family, or my camera with me. Um, back to the good light. 
kind of mindset. Uh, okay, am I not, did, did I quit the share now? You did quit the share now. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so now I just wanted to give a few moments uh, or a few a few things of uh, ideas about what it is that I look for when I'm judging the contest. I I get the chance to look at you know a hundred over a hundred photographs, but I, I look at them over and over and over, and I I'll run through the entire bundle of photographs at once and just kind of get a general feel for the, the the entire body of work from all the photographers, and then I'll I'll kind of like in an editing iterative process, kind of whittle it down into, you know, exceptional, um, you know, and, and just like good, uh, good, the, the, the wow factors is the first thing that I look for. Uh, and it's, it's so hard to describe, but other than just the, the moment, whatever that may be is, is one of the first things that I look for. I look for great light, uh, technical, you know, sharpness, exposure, color, that kind of thing. However, nothing's really set in stone as much as the moment. Um, I'm happy to, to give a little bit on, on the time of day or the light or the sharpness if, it, if the photograph just really captured an amazing moment. Framing is very important. Um, just making sure that all the elements that you chose to include in the frame complement each other, I think is very important so that there's not distracting elements or too few elements and there's no context to the photo. Um, and I'm like, to go back to the wow moment, I'm just looking for something that really makes me stop and pause and just drink, drink in the photograph. So um, I know that that's not a lot of really hard criteria. But that's just kind of how I work uh, as far as judging contests go. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed panelists now and let them share their work. Steve, I believe you're next. And as you're pulling up your screen share, um, Dave, I do want to um, I have to correct something of what you said when you said that there's and in our contest, particularly when there's kids up to professionals, it is only for amateurs. So we don't, so that's important. I mean, I just want people to know that. Um, and we have, you know, specifics on that um, in the contest rules, but that makes it even more amazing, you know, that the Absolutely. photos that we get aren't from, you know, they're from amateur photographers, which makes them even neater. So Absolutely. Steve, it's all you. All right. Hey guys. Um, hopefully, can you guys see my screen? Okay. Is it full screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, first off, Dave, thank you. And that Pelican picture was incredible. Like, I wish I could have a picture like that. That's amazing. And uh, Dana, thanks for having me speak for a little bit. That's, it's a great honor to do this. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Um, real quick about me. I've been a birder since about 2017. Uh, the hummingbird was my spark bird. I set up a little sugar feeder on my backyard and I mean, I was hooked ever since I saw Ruby Throat Hummingbird. Uh, photography kind of went hand in hand. You know, it's, I feel like birding and photography is a great combo. Um, for work, I'm a Kansas City firefighter. I've been doing that for about 11 years now. Um, I'm also a Missouri Master Naturalist volunteer. I did that class last year and got certified, but with coronavirus going on, there's not a whole lot of volunteer opportunities. Um, I also love native plants. I have about an acre of land and I'm currently killing off. I'm trying to kill off about half of it if my wife lets me to turn into a little micro prairie. And last but not least, I'm a husband and uh, a new father. I have a three month old baby. So if you hear some screaming in the background, I, uh, I apologize. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go through a few photos of mine, kind of describe how I got them why I feel like they're special to me and, you know, if, if there was something I could have improved on, what kind of techniques I use, just real briefly, just kind of go through my process with you guys. So first picture, if I can get this to work. 
Okay, Kentucky Warbler, one of my notorious birds that took me a long time to find. I feel like I almost always heard it, but I rarely saw it. So when I had this photo opportunity, I gasped and I got excited. Um, birders, photographers, you guys probably know these birds, they're hardly rarely in the open. They always hang out on the forest floor, at least for me. But I got this at Longview Lake in the Kansas City area. And I saw it, or I heard it first, then I kind of saw it underneath some shrubs and leaves. And I was just waiting for it to appear. And I kind of pished it a little bit, like birders do that psh, psh, kind of stuff. And finally, after about five minutes, it said, okay, weird guy, like I'll pop out for you and see what's going on. So he gave me a good five seconds on that little branch you see in the picture. And I had to react fast because warblers don't wait for anything. And by the time, <laughs> by the time you focus on it, it's going to move. So I had to be ready. And that's my suggestion of any warbler photographers be ready every second. Cause I mean, they don't give you much time. So what I love about this photo is the lighting. I love the lighting. Um, I'll probably say it a million times, but I love shooting on cloudy days. You know, that's, you avoid all the shadows that way, all the highlights. And um, I also like eye level shooting. It just gives it a more intimate feel for me. And these aren't rules. These are just what I personally love to do. But so this little guy popped up for me. I got a great shot. I had five seconds to do it. I had a fast shutter speed. I probably took I don't know, 50 photos of it. And I was just praying one was in focus. And that's what I ended up with. So that's photo number one. Moving on, same family, the warbler family. This is the Northern Parallel. Uh, I got it last May as well during spring migration. And I think I spent a good hour staring at this little guy. And I was just waiting for him to come down again because I had warbler neck like this the entire time just waiting for him to come down and say hi. And for this one, um, I used a callback on my app. I played the parallel song, which I know is kind of hotly debated if you're supposed to do that or not, but I tried not to disturb him too much. So finally he came down, he was curious, and I really liked the pose he gave me right here. Kind of just a, I'm gonna land here real quick and take off real fast kind of pose. And I like the sharpness of it. I like that it's in focus. And I really like that it brings up that chestnut colored chest of his, which I feel like this is a bird us birders take for granted because we see it all the time in spring and summer, as far as warblers go. But when I see one eye level and this close to me, it really sparked me and changed my mind how cool these warblers really are. So I just really enjoyed that. And I love the background as well. It's kind of a nice creamy background mixed with trees and grasses, which I really liked. All right, moving on. Okay, so this isn't a Missouri photograph, obviously, but I had to share it because I love it. This is a cactus wren, and I believe it's the largest wren in North America, and it acts like it. It is loud and proud, for sure. And the lighting's a little harsher than I wish it was. It was full sun, but I really love this because it shows the type of environment that it's used to and that it lives in, that it thrives on. I mean, I barely touched that cactus and I was bleeding. I don't know how the heck a bird flies and lands on this thing and makes a living out of it. But I had a lot of fun with this one. And again, I love clean backgrounds like this really nice green background. Oh, hold on. Something just popped up. Sorry about that. Um, I love the nice, you know, clean background. I like the sharpness and the cactus really brings the picture out to me. It just kind of adds a little extra to it. But moving on, Greater Prairie Chicken. So this one, it's not my sharpest photo, but I love the story behind it. And I think a story is just as important as the actual photo is. So I had to get up at 2.30 in the morning just to see this guy, because I had to go to Dunn Ranch up north, which if you guys aren't familiar with that place, I can't remember the town, but it's really close to the Missouri-Iowa border. I mean, it's a really long drive from Kansas City. 
So I had to get there, I had to get to a parking lot and meet seven or eight strangers in pitch black, sign some waivers, go on a 20 minute hike in the dark with people I've never met, get inside of a tiny little trailer in the pitch black, let me remind you, we have tiny little windows and we were just sitting in the dark waiting for the magic to happen. And then the sun rose about a half hour later and it was just the coolest show I've ever seen. I mean, I saw, I can't remember exactly, but probably a dozen males like this one right here, just strutting around, making their calls, making their boom noises on the leg, just trying to impress one female. It's like I was at the nightclub again or something, but it was a good time. Um, as far as the technical aspects of this, I mean, I wish it was a little better in focus. I love to get the eye in focus more than anything else. And I feel like I missed on that, but they'll always be back. So I can go again, but I think this year they canceled it because of COVID obviously. So hopefully next year we can go back again. But if you guys haven't gone, I highly recommend it. And I, I think MDC runs it. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dana, at the end, but Okay, that's that one. Okay, male downy woodpecker. This one was taken in my backyard and I kind of call it my trick shot. And you'll kind of see why I'm saying that at the end. So I know a lot of people, including me, take a lot of photos in your backyard of birds. And what I constantly see, and which what I did for a long time, I took pictures of birds on bird feeders. And I got tired of seeing bird feeders in the photos because it just didn't feel very natural to me. So what I decided to do was screw in this branch onto my deck railing slightly above and have my silver maple be in the background where you get that creamy green color. My wife was mad at me for a while because our deck looked ridiculous with branches screwed into deck rails. But, you know, when you're a birder, what can you do? So, um, if you look closely, you can see its bill has suet on it. And I'll show you my next photo, my setup. So obviously these are different birds, but you can see what I did. I put mounds of suet on the deck rails, oranges with jelly on top. And basically I waited till the birds landed on the branch, inspected the food, ate the food, and then flew away. So I kind of had a feeling I had a few seconds every time a bird landed on a branch to get a great photo. It's ridiculous, I know, but it's, I had fun with it. I can't say it's my favorite way of shooting, but I kind of wanted to bring this up just because of, oops, oh, I, just because of this year, a lot of people are staying at home with coronavirus. So if you want to enhance your photography at home, that's kind of my way to do it. I mean, it's kind of a, a photography hack, I guess, for birds, but I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, no one will ever know that a bird feeder was right below this bird. So moving on. Okay, green heron. So this was not Missouri. This was South Padre Island last year, but I wanted to share it because I think this is the only photo I've ever got of a heron catching a fish. And I just thought it was fantastic. And the lighting was interesting. It kind of created a little haze on the bottom right, which at first I tried to add it out, but then I initially kind of liked it. The more I looked at it, just kind of added an extra element to it. But I was able to get this one mainly in part because I was on a boardwalk and it was kind of like a miniature blind, I guess. But those are fun and obviously you can find those in Missouri. Okay, so this is my photo that got the co-grand prize last year. American Goldfinch, obviously. Um, this was one of the more curious goldfinches I've ever met because I walked up to him probably a good 15 feet away and he was just staring at me, acting like it was no big deal. And he was standing on top of this thistle plant. And first I didn't take any pictures. I just kept watching him because I was just amazed and just having a good time with him. And the more comfortable he got with me, he just started going crazy on this thistle plant and just making seeds pop everywhere. And that's when I realized, okay, get my camera up, start taking a million pictures and see if I get a good one. And I love the photo, but I kind of just, it made me realize how important plants really are for these birds. And it kind of changed my mindset of gardening at home because I used to always cut back my plants right after they bloomed 
just because I wanted them to look good. You know, that's what I grew up doing. I didn't know any better. But then I realized I'm taking all the food sources away from these birds when I do that. So now I leave all my plants up throughout the winter, the cone flowers, tick seed, anything. Um, and I enjoy it. I get to see birds like this. I saw pine siskins a couple of weeks ago attacking my cone flowers. And, you know, if you're, if you're lazy with gardening, you get rewarded with extra birds. That's what I tell people. So, <laughs> so that's the story on that one. Okay, so barred owl. I got this at Blue Springs Lake in the Kansas City area. This was right after I left a local wetland. It was getting close to dusk and I was driving. And then all of a sudden I saw this little guy in the corner of my eye and I slammed on my brakes. I almost got in a car wreck just getting this photo. And then the guy that parked behind me ran out of his car to make sure I was okay. And he knocked on my window and I looked at him. I said, do not move another inch. Don't talk to me, don't move. I rolled down my window, get out my camera lens. And then he sees what I'm looking at. And I got the photo obviously. And I was more excited about the other driver though, because he told me, wow, like I never would have saw that owl if it wasn't for you. Like you just made my day. Like, thank you so much. That was so cool. And I'm like, thank you. And I'm sorry, I almost got in a wreck with you, but it was fun. So about this photo, I liked the owl in the foreground, but if I could have improved on it, I don't like the background. It's distracting to me. So as a photographer, I try and keep that in mind. You know, I think the background is just as important as the foreground. I mean, that can make or break a picture from a good photo to a great photo. But I'm also very picky. I know it's a great photo, but sometimes I think about that stuff in the end. Okay, let's see. Okay, so most of my photos I've showed you have been more portrait style, kind of up close, but I also like doing where the birds are kind of small in the frame and it shows the total scene instead. And this is not a Missouri bird. This was on my honeymoon in Alaska a couple of years ago. And I was on a tour bus driving through Denali National Park and I noticed this deer falcon in the corner of my eye hanging out on a cliff. And I yelled at the bus driver, stop the bus. And she slammed on the brakes and everyone on the bus thought I saw a grizzly bear because that's what everyone was looking for. And I said, no, everyone look to your left. That's a deer falcon. And they all just looked at me like, oh, okay, whatever, cool. You know, they gave me two seconds, like, okay, get your picture. And that totally made my day. I mean, that was more exciting than any grizzly bear that day for me. But I just like this picture. It's not the sharpest of the uh, falcons it's kind of far away but i just love the background how creamy it is and i love the setting i'm pretty sure that was a nesting site because i saw a chick that i couldn't get a picture of but overall i just love that scene i just wanted to share it but not a missouri bird but that's okay we can still pretend okay so tips and tricks i've kind of talked about these already but first off this photo is a prothonotary warbler I got last spring. Um, be patient. That's my number one tip. And that's going to be my last tip as well. I mean, that is crucial. And me being a birder first, I feel like birding and photography are, they're both, you can do it together, but they're different mentalities. If you're a birder, you might move more and look for different habitats, and look for different birds. But if you want a really great photo, sometimes you just have to be patient and stay in the same area for a half hour until you get that perfect moment. Um, me personally, shoot on cloudy overcast days. I know that's not a rule. That's just what I like to do because I don't like dealing with the shadows. Um, focus on the eye. So on your camera, if you could set your autofocus points to just a single autofocus point, I always try my best to aim for the eye because if the eye is not in focus, it's just a messy picture, I feel like. Um, be eye level with your bird. I just, I just started doing that recently and I love how they turn out. Like it just, it feels better to me. It kind of, uh, what's the word? It just feels kind of more romantic, I guess. You know, you're more intimate with the bird that way. Just like you're talking to someone eye level. Uh, clean backgrounds, I've mentioned that a bunch. I love that you know, minimal distractions, just let the bird be in the picture. Keep it natural. 
I mean, I've seen great photos with birds on bird feeders, but I just, there's something about getting a picture of a bird in the wild or making it appear that they're in the wild that just gives it that extra factor, you know? And then have fun, appreciate each moment. I mean, you might not ever see that bird again. You never know. So just really enjoy it. And then a good friend of mine said, just take photos for you, man. Like, don't worry about any social media, you know, likes or any of that. Just do it for you. Have fun. And that's it. I've been living by those rules for a couple of years now, and I'm having a blast doing it. This is my last slide. I just wanted to say thank you, MRBO. Thank you, Dana and Ethan, Eric, and the rest of the staff. Um, so this was in North Carolina and the Outer Banks. My wife and I were just enjoying a sunset with this really cool osprey right here, enjoying it with us. So I appreciate it, guys. Thanks for letting me talk. I will hit the mute button. Thanks, Steve. And I'm about to put um, a link to Dunn Ranch in the chat for everyone. Um, it's MDC helps with the prairie chicken viewing, but it's owned by Nature Conservancy and totally couldn't agree more that it is awesome to go see prairie chicken viewing. And with that, Bill, yes. over to you, sir. Okay. Let me know when my slide comes up. I'll tell you what, it may be best to go to Eric and let me see if I can work through this. That's okay. I don't. Okay, that sounds good because we it's definitely want to see to your slides. The, yeah, I know we're running on low, low on time. That's right. I, okay. I can start mine and I have the least amount of expertise to give you all. So <laughs> we'll definitely want to hear Bill's. Can you all see this? Yep. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Well, just a little background about myself. Uh, and my photography background. Um, so I started taking photos with the current camera I have in 2016. So I, I, said, I started taking photographs mainly to ID birds because it's a great way. If you're not sure what it is, you can get a snapshot of it. And then, you know, when the bird's there just for a little bit and you can just see it in your binoculars for a little, you know, just for that fleeting moment, you can see it, uh, you know, forever when you have a recording of it. Um, so then in 2017, I started documenting this by taking photos. So I started uh, working on the grassland project here with Merbo and we took a lot of photos of nestlings and nests uh, for you know, aging purposes. And also just, I mean, who doesn't like baby bird photos? So um, I started doing that. And then during surveys, I'll often uh, have my camera out. And so most of the time I have my camera out, but uh, there's been a few instance, instances where I haven't and I, didn't get a good uh, photo of a bird. So I need to take David's advice and always keep my camera on me. Um, and then, so a lot of use of my photos are for social media in part, just for, um, you know, showing Merbo followers on our page, uh, you know, what we're seeing and just cool birds uh, and pretty pictures. So in this one here, the picture is Leconte Sparrow at Lindscombe Wildlife Area. Uh, I just really love this shot. It's one of my best photos I've taken. Um, such an awesome bird. And I really like the background too, mixes of the whites and yellows. Okay, Bill, you're back on. It really complements, it really complements uh, the bird, I think. So this is the equipment I use. It's a Nikon Coolpix P610. And then for the uh, nest photos, I take my iPhone just because you can't get a good quality shot with the camera that close of range. Uh, and also some of those nests are pretty, uh, obscured with vegetation. So you need something really small you can get in there uh, without uh, disturbing the substrate. So here's one shot. Uh, this is the white wing crossbill that was been hanging out at the office. Many of y'all probably have seen that. Um, and um, I don't know if you guys can hear this. I think I might need to stop sharing and share it again so you can hear sound. Um, let me do that right now. All right, let's see if you can hear this now. It's pretty quiet, but they have this call that's kind of more a mechanical cheat, 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 cheat. Anyways, um, I got him calling one day, but now he's, he's not here, but it was great to just see this guy down 
uh, below the feeders for you know about a week or so. Um, but just kind of to show you how I get this photo, I mean, I just changed my uh, camera to bird watching mode uh, and you know just point, zoom, and, sh and you know shoot, uh, shoot the shutter or click the shutter. So that's I mean, you can get some pretty good shots, I think, just with um, you know a decent point and click uh, camera. Uh, so this is what I use for uh, showcasing photos. Oftentimes, uh, I use this app called Layout, and then it can access your library of photos, and you can select however many photos you want to show in a collage, and then you can choose a layout, and um, then you can, this is kind of result of one. So this is a uh, kind of a nest cycle of a dick sizzle. So you have the nest, the eggs, the young, as they get progressively older, and then a little fledgling right here. So it's great because then this is just one picture, but it could show a whole story and, and uh, you know, a lot of these all complement each other. And um, so it's great because it's a smaller size, but it shows more than just one photo. And so I just showed another one here using that layout app. And this one's a Penzo Sparrows on the left. And then on the right, another option I can do is to just showcase two birds side to side. Uh, so the, here's a LeConte and a Nelson Sparrow. And you can now see some of the differences uh, that you can use for IDing. Uh, so the longer beak and the real gray, clean gray nape. Um, and I just kind of like these photos because in this photo, there's a lot of the gray in the background and in the foreground. There's, this guy is really tough to get uh, a shot of. Uh, this is the best I got. I know it's not that great. And then there's the LeConte here. And I really like this red. It kind of um, accents the legs and the back. Uh, and the nape as well. Um, and so now I want to just show you a couple photos that I've taken, um, which have some cool stories to them as well. Um, and so this is an American bittern. Uh, a lot of y'all probably know that. Oh, I guess it wants to skip through. Let's see if it wants to keep skipping. All right, so now oh, it does. Um, I'll just keep it like this. So this American bittern, this is at a wetland park in central Florida called Sweetwater Wetlands Park. And there's tons of bitterns, storks, uh, waterfowl, uh, gallinules, and, uh, and gray-headed swamp hen, uh, kind of invasive down there. And so this guy was right next to the path that I was walking by. They have a path that you can just take around the wetland. And I just had to get this shot. And look at that, I really love the details and the feathers and those eyes. Um, it's just amazing. And I got some good videos of him um, kind of meandering through the wetland as well. And um, I have bitterns on here just because um, these are two great shots. And as if you all, I mean, many of you all, since you're photographers and your birders as well, you know how hard it is to see bitterns and rails in uh, the in the wetland. You can hear them more often than see. So I just really love um, to showcase the two, the, one of the few chances I've had to, to get a good shot of bitterns. And here's a you know, classic pose of a least bittern on the cattails. Um, just a gorgeous shot. Uh, I wish it was you know, not, his neck wasn't in shadow as much, but you know, you take what I could get. And then here's one of Mountain Bluebird. This had a good story. Um, Paige, the educator, and I were birding Wakanta Prairie a couple of years ago, and we found this Mountain Bluebird, and uh, it was you know, a big sight to see. A lot of birders went down to, to take a look and he hung out there for a couple months. And I just love this shot um, in part because it's one of the best ones I had of the mountain bluebird. So uh, there was a small pool to pick out from, uh, but this, I love how the, the gray and blue is, is kind of, it kind of blends right in with the background. And then you have this on, on the edge here, you can see this bright sky blue kind of peeking through. And uh, it just makes me wonder, you know, what does that other side look like? He's just giving me a little glimpse, a tease. Uh, this one has uh, meaning to me because this is a blue-throated macaw, which is an endemic uh, and endangered species to uh, North Central Bolivia. And I spent uh, several months volunteering with a conservation organization uh, trying to help these birds. Um, and so we were out here nest searching. They like to nest in cavities. And so I managed to get this shot and now I almost got the whole bird into it, but I, it's just a long 
long tail and a big bird. And you can really see that blue throat. And uh, in Spanish, it's paraba, uh, barba azul. So it's the blue, blue bearded macaw. And also while I was on that same uh, hike, I saw three different species of owls and I had to take a picture of this tropical screech owl. Um, just really nice shot. The other ones were not as crisp, uh, but it's just amazing to see these guys out in the wild uh, in broad daylight. Um, so it was just a really exciting day for me. But that's all I have. Thanks everybody. And uh, hopefully Bill's got his sorted out. Bill's back. Him. Thanks much, Eric. And I just wanted to say that, because you ended on South American birds, um, Eric and Matt Longabaugh, um, who's a technician with us, are doing a couple of webinars on South American birds here coming up. Um, so we can see more cool South American bird pictures. And I'm going to put a link to our events um, page in the chat so that people can sign up for that if they'd like. Bill, are you pretty good? I'm going to give it a try. All right. Nice. <laughs> coming up. It's coming up. Cool. Let me know if that comes up. Looks like a little bit of a lag, but it says, it. yep, there it is. Okay. Well, All right. Thank you. Sorry about that earlier. I had to log off and log back on. Um, so um, what I did this summer, um, kind of in the lockdown, I kind of stayed on my farm and uh, continued working on a project I've been working on over the last couple of years. And that's to try to capture um, some intimate, um, and intimate pictures of prairie species, primarily the, spear, the sparrows and um, some of the wrens. Um, and I really was really wanting to try to get some nice flight shots of these species, which are very difficult. Um, so this summer I focused on the grasshopper sparrow which uh, anyone that's a, a real birder out there knows that that's, that species does not like to go. It, it, it primarily mode of transportation is running on the ground through the grass and not really flying much. If you do see it, it's typically on a country road and it's on a barbed wire fence line, um, a male singing. Um, if you're out in the grasslands, um, they'll usually just below the highest grass, then they'll be. Um, holding on to grass or, or a sedge or a prairie flower and singing away, but a lot of times you can't see them unless you're pretty close to them. So my goal was to try to get out there and, and uh, get some nice shots. I've been doing that with some of the other um, sparrow species. And uh, so this is, this is part of my farm right here um, where my golf cart is parked right there and my dog is right exactly where I'm going to be photographing from. There was a a nesting pair out here. I never did locate where their nest was. I didn't want to walk out into the grass because of, with my uh, size 13 shoes, I'd end up stepping on it more than finding it. So, and it was interesting as they bring food in and, and all, sometimes they go to the left, sometimes they go to the right. And I never could determine where they were actually going down to the nest, but I knew it was somewhere probably within uh, 30 yards of me. So I, uh, where that golf cart was parked now, here's um, my typical, I, I did this over about a four week period and I was out there probably uh, average of three days a week. And I, it was always in the evening, right at sundown, uh, two hours before sunset, I would um, go on out there. I would set up all my equipment and then I would just wait for the right light. Um, and typically that was the last half hour of the light. I was also using um, playback um, from my iPhone um, or actually little speakers I had, a couple of, and I'll put that up, the little Bluetooth speaker, I had two of them. And because I was using sound, um, I didn't want to, I wanted to minimize it as much as possible. It, it is a known fact that overuse of um, playback recordings of bird calls can hinder their nesting, uh, their nesting activity. And that's why anytime you go to a national park or wildlife refuge, it's usually um, it, it's forbidden, you're not allowed to do that. I'm doing this on my own property. I'm the only one that goes out in this field. And I'm keeping, what I tried to do is my shooting, I try to keep to about 45 minutes of shooting, even though I'd be out there a total of two hours. And then within that 45 minutes, not using the playback more than about 10 minutes total. Um, so I wasn't overusing it. What I found was um, I was out there so often that the bird, I would pull my 
pickup truck out there where I, with all my gear. And as I was getting everything set up, he would come to me. And it was amazing how close, uh, and I've had this experience with other prairie sparrows. Um, most people think they're very invasive, but if you spend a lot of time in the prairie and you're quiet, you don't move a whole lot, uh, you can get really close to them. So here's my setup. I'm gonna just real quickly diagram what I've got here. The two red circles are my left and right. And I would put, um, I, had, I started out with little sticks and so it gave them perches. And then as it went on, I, you know, to me in a prairie, sticks like I was using, getting really nice shots of them perched on the sticks, isn't real natural because there's not a whole lot of sticks on a prairie. So I quickly, once I got used to those perches, I would switch to prairie flowers that were already blooming in my fields and I would um, put those on there and then get shots of them perched in the flowers um, uh, that were more natural. The blue line is where I was wanting the bird to fly from one perch to the other across the open grass where I've mowed. What I'm trying to do is if I was pointing my camera uh, straight into the field, I would end up with a real busy background in the, with the, in the flight shot. So having it uh, fly across an open area, I was able to get the more clear background that I was looking for. Um, the yellow uh, arrow pointing up, it's in the ground there is where my um, laser trigger is. And it's, uh, you'll see it in um, more pictures here in a minute, but it's uh, the Sabre by Cognacyst. And the reason why I like that trigger, it's the only one on the market I know of that uses LIDAR um, as the laser, and that does not hinder the bird. Any other laser that I know of, you can, you can actually cause eye damage to birds. And a lot of folks that have done uh, in years past um, using lasers to, to catch birds in flight, they don't realize they, they're probably damaging those birds' eyes. But with this new, it's a new technology, it uses LIDAR and it does not harm the bird. Um, next one. So this is kind of what happens from the yellow arrow pointing down. So the bird crosses, it breaks that beam right above the top of that arrow. Um, and then it sends the signal back down to the, it, it basically reflects it back down to the, that um, saber connector. And then the, it immediately sends a, a signal up to the camera and fires the camera. When the camera fires, I have a, um, an icon control unit up here that controls my flash. Flashes, it's the uh, wireless speed light commander SU-800, those familiar with Nikon. And it fires these two flashes. And the only reason I'm using these flashes is for fill light. I'm not using it for stop action in, this, in, in the scenarios I was shooting this time. In my hummingbird photography, I use the flashes to stop action. In this case, I'm not, I'm wanting to get the ambient light and these are just fill flashes. Once at the same time those are firing, it takes the picture and then I'm using a cam ranger and it's a, uh, it, it's the, it, it's, um, it sends a signal to my I, iPad, it's right here. And so as I'm shooting, I'm getting, I'm seeing what I'm shooting. And from my iPad, I can control all the features on my camera, adjust the uh, exposure. So that's general setup for trying to get those flight shots. At the same time, because I'm only shooting for 45 minutes and I only have that quality light for that amount of time, I'm actually running three cameras. I've got that going and I don't really have to do any. It's, it's that little trigger right there is doing all the work and I could see what's coming up and I only look at the screen. If I need to make adjustments, I'll make the adjustments. Meanwhile, I've got this camera right here and it's, it's shooting directly right there. Let me go to the next screen. Okay, so it's, it's aiming and it's getting still shots as they land on that flower right there. That's a, I, I've changed my lenses around over the month, but here I'm, this is a 300 millimeter 2.8 lens. And as it's shooting, I, I'm actually controlling that with um, a wireless trigger. And I, I like to use the uh, pocket wizards. This is the multi-max pocket wizard. So I'm holding one in my hand and there's another one right here underneath the camera. And so this one's on transmit, this is on receive. As they land on the flower, I'm pushing a button, I'm catching catching shots right there. If they come over and they're landing on this one, I'm hand holding, I got a 500 millimeter uh, lens right here. And that's why, actually why I'm backed up so far. I'm not really, it, it, all this is within about a 15 foot radius to tell you the truth, I'm only about 15 feet away. But if I'm any closer, um, the, the image is actually too tight on the 500 millimeter. This bird is not scared of me at all. It would land right here on the ground. Uh, 
oh, I could almost reach out and touch it and it would peck around in the grass beside me. Um, it got so used to me being out there. So here's just looking back in the other direction. Um, if you, I, I would use my truck just to lay everything out. And then once I got everything arranged, I would move my truck forward because the light, the sun would come directly over top of my, my uh, truck and it would set that way. So I had to get my truck out of the way. And that's why I'm actually sitting over here um, on this yellow bucket out of the way so my shadow would not cast across everything I was shooting. Um, that's again, that's the trigger right there for the flight shots. So um, example of some of the shots I was getting, it's really nice, the bird singing. This is an example of it on the, how I started out with using a stick as a perch. Um, so I'm, I'm, on a lot of these shots, I'm gonna provide the shooting data, but I'm not gonna really cover them in detail. Um, I think this uh, video is gonna be available later. You can look at it in more detail later if you wanted to review the video. Um, a sunflower, this is actually a sunflower out of our garden, but it's very similar to some of the other sunflowers that are around the fields. Uh, one thing that, that's uh, distinguishing with the, uh, the grasshopper sparrow is the, the uh, yellow chevrons on its shoulders, and they're not always visible, but they're very pretty. And the shooting data on that one. Uh, and so what was kind of an interesting behavior, it would, it's as I was out there for a week or so, it, the male would bring food and almost like want to show me the food it was catching um, and bringing to its young. Although I never did see where it flew to take it to the young. Sometimes it would go to left, sometimes it was going right. But um, this is a cutworm it's got. And that was probably the most common uh, insect species that I saw it bring in was the, the cutworms. Um, there's the shooting data on that. It's uh, iron weed is what it's landed on. Have these uh, quite a few iron weed um, plants in my fields. And then of course it's not called the grasshopper sparrow for nothing. And the uh, the flight shots were interesting because it was a it was fun, but it was also a exercise in frustration. The the uh, sparrow. My, my grand design was for it to fly from uh, right to left. And as it would cross this beam up about two feet above, above the ground, that it would trigger. Well, I found real quickly that I, this, this camera, this uh, saber, I had about eight inches off the ground, all right, on a little teeny, one of the little small tripods, and uh, just about eight inches off the ground from here down. And the bird would not go straight fly directly across. It would fly from the one perch down and land on it and then fly up to the other. And then it would go back and back. Um, it was the most frustrating thing. Um, I, I failed to mention the beakers I had were at the base. They're in the tall grass, but at the base of each perch on, on the left and right side. And I, could, I controlled one with my iPhone. I called, controlled the other one with my iPad. So once I would get it to land on one perch, say on the left, I would briefly for like just the first note or two, play it a call on the right. And then it would immediately fly over to that perch and look down in the grass. And then I could get it to fly back and um, repetitively. And that's how I did the repetition to get the flight shots. But initially this was the most frustrating thing. And to laugh at me would land on and sit there and sing towards me. And it was just hilarious. And, Great shots, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Of course, the company, uh, Cognizus, just, you know, they want, I can't give them enough of these shots, you know, it's, it's promotional for them, but, um, you know, I'm still writing an article for them on that. But uh, I think I got my stats there. But this is what I was after eventually. The, the key was I ended up one night, I just went home and got a shovel and I dug a hole and I put my laser trigger down in a hole so it no longer could land on it. And that was the trick. It solved the whole thing. Then it was flying back and forth exactly like I wanted. This is, I was looking to get shots of the wing, the, how the wings flare. A lot of people, you know, they just aren't documentation of this type uh, on uh, this sparrow species. And then with the wings down. So that was a great exercise. Um, some of my shooting data on that. And then um, th this is, uh, Really, 
you know, people say, well, you gotta have a 600 millimeter lens for this. No, you, you don't necessarily have to have that. If you're using a remote trigger like I was using here, I had my camera very close uh, framing, the, the bird would frame the whole, the whole image or the whole, you know, the, the bird would fill the whole frame. And, but I was sitting back and using the camera trigger, just shooting away. And when it bring in grasshoppers like this. And so it gets some really nice shots. People could do this on their bird feeders um, and be inside in the warm and use in a trigger. Almost every camera made that you can find a trigger to use. It's interesting, the, um, if you look at the grasshopper, it, the wings are off, uh, one of the two legs are off. They take, to, before they feed the young, they take the legs and the wings off. So that, that was pretty much it. But I, this is an example of you can, using the same technique um, on a birdhouse that's in my backyard. And uh, where I've got, I'm using the, the, the laser trigger. And it, what I, it does is it's directly below the birdhouse on the ground pointing straight up. And so when it would fly in and out, it was automatically triggering my camera. And this was a shot, I, I have tried to get that shot for years and years. It's the first wing beat of a bluebird as it leaves, leaves the nest. And it's the most difficult thing because you could sit there for hours and the minute you're not looking, it, it leaps off and makes that jump. So with a laser trigger like I'm using, um, first time, it was the very first time I set it up, first shot it took and it nailed it right off the bat. It was unbelievable. I was like, how many hours did I have spent invested trying to get that thing shot? Uh, and then again, uh, not birds, but uh, very useful to using those techniques to get flight shots of insects like this. So I think I'll leave it with that. Um, thank, thanks for, uh, Dana, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, that was awesome. Thanks so much. I knew that you were going to go specifically through some grasshopper sparrow work, but that was, that was really cool. <laughs> um, let's see. I first want to thank, uh, both Bill and Steve for, mentioning um limiting your use of playback because as both of you mentioned it can be disruptive and it's really nice to hear that you're limiting that um and then also bill and eric got into this a little bit because he does um you know nest searching and monitoring as as part of his job but both of you mentioned just like being really careful around the vegetation and around nests so thank you for for all of that um our first question in the q a um, our only question right now, and we definitely encourage folks to put more questions on, but um, someone asks, can we revisit the laser eye damage thing? I've never heard of that. Bill says he doesn't use that, but some photographers do, question mark. So, Bill, I don't know if you want to so, revisit that. So, or... yeah, just like a, uh, a laser pointer, uh, you know, if you point a laser pointer in your eye, you're going to damage your eye. All right. It's the same thing on most lasers that are out there. I have a, the, the, the first laser trigger I bought, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago. It is great for doing like water droplet photography or trying to shoot an arrow through a balloon and capture that. But that thing is so powerful that I found that when I was uh, using that, that I had to not have anybody in, around me at the time because the reflection, if it, if it like reflected off a window or a you know, it would get, get you it was very powerful. And a lot of them are like that. Um, and I, I think a lot of people don't realize a lot of the laser, the laser triggers, the, the triggers that are um, used lasers have that issue. And so anytime you go to purchase one, you should look, you should look up to see, does it, is it eye safe? And I think you'll find if it's not uh, the Sabre by Kong Assist, it's probably going to have an issue. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question or not. That certainly helped a lot. Thank you. I, I guess the bottom line is if you wouldn't want to look at it with your eye, you don't want to point it at a bird or an animal. Um, is there a how-to manual that would list Bill's setup, supplies, trigger info, et cetera? Um, I, I don't think there is. There, you can find anything on YouTube, I should say. Um, and uh, the company Cognosys, um, they have quite a bit of stuff on their, um, on their website. It's spelled C-O-G-N-I-S-Y-S. -S. And this is specifically the Sabre, but they sell other um, triggering devices. And they have a lot of tutorials on there by uh, various professionals. 
And you did mention, and it is so, that this is being recorded. So if folks want to come back and review any part of this, um, listen to any of the tips or see the slides, then it will be up on our website um, probably as of tomorrow. So any other questions? I know we've gone a little bit over here, but we still have definitely the majority of folks still with us. So if anybody has anything or if any of you guys want to make any um, further remarks. We got one more question. Do you all use blinds? And I think anyone can answer that. Do you use blind, blinds to take photos? I, I've used blinds in the past. I've uh, also one of the guides up at uh, Dunn Ranch for the prairie chickens. And of course, they're always using a blind there. But uh, I find by being still you can and, and being patient, um, I normally do not have to use a blind. And I try to do it. I prefer not to because by seeing your surroundings more, a lot of times when you're blind, you've you got tunnel vision on what you're looking at. Um, so I prefer not to, but I, I have in certain situations. Um, I, 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 Reminds me of one thing I meant to mention during my presentation was um, uh, Brad Jacobs, the, the former um, ornithologist for Missouri, had a great quote one time, and he says, "If you really want to learn sparrows, get a good lawn chair that's nice and comfortable." Anybody, Anybody else, else want to blind? comment on blinds? Yeah, I was just going to say, I've, I've never used a blind other than the prairie chicken photo I shared. Everything else was just kind of standing around, being still and patient. Dave, blinds ever? Yeah, I use, I use a blind on occasion, but uh, my truck functions as a pretty good blind too. So, um, and Steve mentioned that the boardwalk was a blind. Uh, in his South Padre picture. So, um, but I really, I, I only pull it out probably twice a year. So I'll add one more thing to the blinds. I still don't have a great photo of any waterfowl. And I think you almost have to have a blind to get a stunning image of any kind of duck because they can see you from so far away and they're so skittish, at least in my personal experience. I'd have to agree with what David was saying um, about the car as a good blind. Um, so if there's good places you can go that you can drive to get a shot, I, I, it's worked for me a bunch, but other than that, I haven't used a blind. Um, and I mean, the car works so well, I've even had metal arcs come to their nest, you know, 10 minutes. 10 to 15 feet away and they just landed right there. But if you get out of the car, they, they notice you and they, they recognize you as a threat. So it's just interesting that that car still hasn't, and the birds haven't adapted to recognize cars. Um, anyways. And I'll, I'll add that um, if I'm taking photos of animals, deer, elk, uh, raccoons, you know, whatever, uh, they feel safe in the car when I'm in the car, but the second they see my foot, I was trying to step out to get a better angle, they're, they're gone. So, you know, just to second that. Uh, someone asked Steve, what kind of camera and lens do you use? Um, I shoot micro four thirds. I have an Olympus brand camera and I used to shoot Nikon, the DSLRs, but since I switched to Olympus, I've been so happy. Um, the advantages are it's much more lightweight for long distance hiking. Um, I could really get about the same focal length because my lens, it's a prime 300 millimeter F4, but being a mirrorless camera, you get the two times crop factor. So essentially you have 600 millimeters equivalent just by carrying a smaller mirrorless camera lens basically. And I feel like the sharpness is equal or very close, good enough for me at least. Um, in regards to um, the, the comments on waterfowl, a mallard pair in Columbia isn't shy if anyone needs a mallard photo. Um, 
suggests Kim. And then Gary asks, can you give me a sense of how far away from the birds some of these earlier pictures were taken? I got the just from the stick screwed into the deck. How about some of the other shots? Um, yeah, the, the deck shots were just from my window to the deck. So 15, 20 feet, not too far. Um, all the other shots were pretty similar. Um, I try my best not to do too much heavy cropping on my photos because you lose a little quality that way. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe 20 to 50 feet, most of my shots, if I had to ballpark. And then Christine Klein asks, do any of the panelists offer beginner photography for children? I'm wondering if this is something we could add to the Wings Over Weston Festival, um, which folks in the Kansas City area are probably aware of um, in 2022. So does anybody do photography workshops? <laughs> Uh, I could use one myself. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to work on something. Aaron says, thanks for the great program. None of the photographers mentioned the rule of thirds. Any comments on that? Um, I, I try to keep that in mind, but I just think of it more of a suggestion than a rule. I mean, you could always break that rule, but uh, I think there is something to it. If the subject is right in the center of the frame, it's not as pleasing to your eyes if it's in one of the corners or the thirds. So there's something to it, but I try not to make that my main focus point when I'm shooting. But uh, Dave might have different ideas since he judges it. No, I think that was a good, that was a good summation there. It's it's a suggestion, not a rule. And if it, you know, if it just kind of feels right, it is right. So that's kind of how I, how I go with it. It's not a hard and fast thing to stick to. Looks like our last question here, guys, is um, Ryan's in desperate need of a spotting scope. Any suggestions on brands and power? He enjoys his Vortex 10 by 42 binoculars. And since all of you are birders as well, um, did anybody have a spotting? I would say Swarovski, Ryan. Um, I know there's, <laughs> there's a couple of decent options that if you like Vortex brand, there's there's two Vortex models that are you know under a thousand dollars. Like one's three hundred and one's six hundred or something. So I think it's similar. Like the Viper, they have a Viper model or something like that. And so I those are ones that I'm looking at, and they seem somewhat affordable, but I'd like to hear what other people have to say. I'm sure you all have better scopes than me. This is an unpopular answer for uh, birders, but I don't use a spotting scope anymore. I use my camera, my 300 millimeter lens, and I have a two times teleconverter I attach to it. And being a mirrorless camera, I already get that two times crop factor. So I'm essentially getting 1200 millimeters just off my camera alone. And then if I zoom in times two, that's 2,400 millimeters, which is pretty much equal to a spotting scope, roughly. And um, my camera has in-body stabilization. So I can hold the focus button, snap a bunch of pictures, try an ID, whatever's out there on the lake. And then I've already got a picture. So I don't have to worry about the digiscope or anything like that. But I know that's unpopular with birders, but that's just what I've been doing and I love it. It's less gear to carry for me, so. I come at it from an angle of a you know, bird photographer. You can't throw enough money at the problem. So I've got a Swarovski 95 millimeter. <laughs> I'm going birding pictures. with Bill. <laughs> Um, an anonymous person asks, do you shoot raw or JPEG or a mix of the two? I'll answer that first. I, I shoot uh, strictly raw except for um, when I'm using my um, cam ranger where I'm transmitting uh, the images from my camera to my iPad and it won't do the raw. So when I'm 
doing in that mode on my hummingbird photography and, and like these sparrows where I kind of set it all up, um, I'll be shooting raw plus uh, JPEG. And so that way the raw images are being captured in the, on the camera, but the JPEGs are being transmitted and I can see the preview on my uh, screen. Yeah, raw versus JPEG is a battle I'm still having with myself to this day because I know raw is the superior way to shoot. There's no argument against that. But there's also the time factor, the size of the files, the uploading, and there's just a lot more work that goes into raw files. But I finally made the compromise to what Bill said. I'm shooting raw and JPEG. So photos that I truly love and want every possible detail out of it, I will upload the raw file. Anything else, I'm totally fine with the JPEG. I shoot everything in raw myself, uh, just from the nature of my work. Um, uh, I I don't think I've shot a JPEG in years, uh, just because I, I haven't found a need to. I've got terabytes and terabytes of hard drives I have, have access to. So, but the, uh, the file size is a major uh, Achilles heel of that and upload times are, are significant. So I, I really like the idea of, of doing raw plus JPEG for all the reasons you guys, uh, you guys mentioned. Uh, I just use whatever the default is <laughs> in my camera. <laughs> uh, I don't, I personally don't even know the difference between what raw is or what, I mean, I know a JPEG, is that just how the file is stored? Anyone <laughs> help me out? Yeah, Dave's got a better answer. I was just gonna, I know JPEGs are just compressed files. So you lose data if you're shooting only JPEG and the camera tries to determine what the best like white balance and picture is if you go JPEG. If you shoot raw, you're getting all of that data, but you have to do more editing and the files are larger. So it's kind of a, do you want to work a little harder and make a perfect picture? Or are you okay with what the camera gives you with JPEG is what is my answer basically. That's a great answer. Thanks. Yeah, if you guys haven't learned anything, or if you've only learned one thing about me in this, I'm a simpler is better kind of guy. I don't have a spotting scope. I have a mirrorless camera that weighs an ounce. Uh, I shoot JPEG 90% of the time and I'm totally happy with all of the results. So it's to each their own, whatever you, whatever you prefer in the end. I think that basically answered the last question that was in the Q and A as well. Steve, um, we've got some comments to y'all. Um, nice tutorial, um, did not know what to expect with this webinar and I must say it was awesome, so. That's great, um, let's see, oh, let's see. Ethan Duke asks, is anybody dabbling in video? Uh, I do. Uh, mine comes with a video. The camera I use has a built-in video recording uh, and decent audio, but I actually just bought and splurged on a new camcorder, so it should be here tomorrow. So, Ethan, I'll send you some good shots of all the house sparrows in the backyard. All right, I, our questions have dried up. We've kept you all here for a while and thank you all again very, very much for, for doing this with us. I learned a lot. I'm the world's, world's worst photographer, but um, I love seeing everyone else's pictures and I really appreciate everything that all of you do and, and that you joined us in our audience tonight, so. Thank you, Dana. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end and this will be up on the MRBO website um, sometime tomorrow afternoon. So thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night, everybody.